Hello, I'm Paul Richards with the latest from science. A global race is on to find a COVID-19 vaccine, and there are several being developed in Australia. Scientists say one is likely to begin clinical trials by July this year. Joining us today is Professor Sharon Lewin, a leading infectious disease expert and the director of the Doherty Institute. She's also a fellow of the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences and the Royal Australasian College of Physicians. Hi Sharon, thanks for joining us. Hi Paul, pleasure to be here. The Doherty Institute is involved in the COVID-19 vaccine development in Australia. What can you tell us about current research? Current research at the Doherty on vaccine uh, is a big program for us. Uh, we have two main strategies. One is active vaccination, which is classically what you think of with a vaccine, um, meaning you give um, someone a piece of the virus you're vaccinating against to induce an immune response so that when they're exposed to the real thing, their immune system's armed and ready to go. And the other is a passive vaccination strategy where we can collect or manufacture antibodies or the response from someone who has had the virus and then give them to someone that's uninfected. And it's a way of providing short-term protection and approach that's been used quite successfully in other infections. It's a really complicated process, isn't it? I mean, how difficult is it to develop a vaccine, but for coronaviruses in particular? And, you know, what are some of the challenges? Well, there are hundreds of academics working on vaccine development for all sorts of um, infections, including coronavirus. But to get a vaccine from a good idea in mice into a product in people usually takes a very long time, you know, five to 10 years really, and not many vaccine ideas make it through to the clinic, a bit like how we do drug development. However, you do need a pipeline of new ideas because um, the, 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 the ideas that actually get through to advanced stage testing and then might fall over, um, you need that pipeline ready to go for the, for the next product. You can't wait and then go back to the pipeline. So yes, it is complicated, but vaccine development or vaccine ideas are the cornerstone of work in infection and immunity. So many, many academics have fantastic ideas. However, very few of them get the whole way. It's estimated that clinical trials could start by July in Australia. Can you explain the different stages of clinical trials for those unaware and, and how they work? When you're developing a vaccine, usually you go through these steps in a linear fashion. In a linear fashion. You first of all show the vaccine induces an immune response or it's immunogenic in animals. You then show that the immune response protects the animal from infection and that's sort of the preclinical development. You have a vaccine that induces immunity, is safe in animals, and it protects them from becoming infected. And then the next phase would be to manufacture that vaccine so it's at a high quality um, that you can give it to people. And you then would enter phase one studies, which are usually small studies aimed at making sure the vaccine is safe and sometimes finding the right dose of the vaccine. And you might also measure whether it's immunogenic in humans. Then you would move to phase two studies, which is a larger study in humans, again, looking at safety and immunogenicity. And it might have up to sort of several hundred people in a phase two study. And then you'd move into phase three studies, which often involves thousands of people. And that's where you, when you're evaluating in the field, does this vaccine protect people from infection? And if you go through that sort of linear um, uh, steps of preclinical phase one, two, and three, that could take, you know, five to 10 years. What's happening with coronavirus is very different. That whole timeline is being compressed, but it's quite expensive because it costs quite a bit of money to manufacture vaccines to a grade that's safe for humans. It costs quite a bit of money to run phase one and two studies. And you might be halfway through that when you show that your animal at model shows no protection. So there's a little bit of financial risk, but you know we're in a position at the moment where time is absolutely critical. And then considering how there are so many organisations working on vaccines, both here in Australia, but then globally, how important is that international collaboration and how's that being managed? Can you give me any insight into to how you know the behind the scenes process and how important that is to be able to collaborate globally? 
really important um, in all sites. You want a bit of competition so that you're getting to where you want to go faster. That competition does drive that. But you don't want overlap and duplication because um, you're wasting effort there. Coordination, I think, is pretty good at the more advanced end of manif- of developing the vaccine. So, um, for example, CEPI, the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation, a big funder of um, some of the lead vaccine candidates for coronavirus, they're coordinating because they're the funder. So they have eight or ten groups that um, they would be bringing together and making sure there's quite a lot of coordination and um, UQ, of course, have had CEPI funding for a number of years, even before coronavirus came. So that's a coordinated and very substantial network. The WHO is playing a role in coordinating vaccine um, clinical trials and development um, through an initiative called Solidarity. There's over 100 of these early good ideas. Some of them are being led by small biotech, some of them by big pharma some of them by academia, and there's not that much coordination at that level. And I don't know whether that's bad. Um, you, you know, you, to, you want innovation, so you, you know, people that have a great idea should be able to pursue that great idea. Um, but you want, to, uh, you want competition, because that will drive science quicker, but you want to avoid duplication. And um, it is quite a difficult thing to coordinate at that very early end um, globally. Just an extraordinary effort to, to, that goes into all, all these um, uh, trials in, in development. Now, the, the development of a, a vaccine is time consuming and expensive. There are other things that the Doherty Institute's working on as well. What are the most promising treatments that you're looking at and um, that are currently being developed and trialled? So our um, program on treatments uh, largely is focusing on antivirals, but also on <clears throat> on drugs that modulate the immune system because both of these um, processes are important for coronavirus. My background's in HIV and um, we achieved extraordinary success with managing HIV by just targeting the virus. You turn the virus off and the immune system recovers and people's health returns to normal. It's actually a little different and more complicated in coronavirus where you've got this balance between targeting the virus, targeting the cell where the virus is replicating and targeting the immune system. And all of those components look like they'll be important for managing coronavirus to get improved clinical outcomes. So Kanta Subaru is leading an effort around antiviral drugs and they are at that early phase looking at drugs that target the cell where the virus replicates because there's some evidence that you can block coronavirus replication by turning off host pathways and chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine is a good example of that. They're also developing drugs that target the virus. That's the conventional way we develop antivirals, the sort of antivirals we have for HIV. And that work's being done in partnership with Michael Parker at Bio21. And, um, and, they're, so they're doing, and they're doing a combination of designing new drugs, but also looking at repurposed drugs. The antiviral drugs um, seem to have a big, better and more important role to play early in disease. And there's some emerging data showing that the efficacy of the antiviral drugs, i give you an example, remdesivir is one of them, is greater if you give it within 10 days of symptoms um, compared to more than 10 days of symptoms. While drugs that modify or suppress the immune system um, generally would, I think, have a role when people are in that late phase of the illness where the virus, it's harder to find the virus and you've got more chaos in the immune response. All right, well, Sharon, congratulations on all the work that you and the rest of the Doherty Institute team are doing. And thank you on behalf of all of us for, for that work and especially for your time today. Pleasure. Thanks very much. There's no doubt this is a huge job for scientists around the world and Australia will be playing a big part. And don't forget for regular video updates from the Australian Academy of Science, make sure you follow us on social media. I'm Paul Richards. See you soon. Mm-hmm.